What would you say are the biggest problems today facing children with regards to nutrition? Well, I mean, the biggest problem, unfortunately, is they just have no exposure to fr uh, to fruits and vegetables, like literally zero. Yeah, um, we, uh, uh, in addition to the kitchen, our restaurant group, we created a nonprofit called Big Green, which works with j kids and helping them grow food in America. So mostly in schools, so, uh, school gardens, outdoor classrooms. We've built 650 beautiful outdoor classrooms, but now in addition, we, we help fund thousands of others. And I'll go in and do a, a, a class with kids where we first installed a garden, and they they they'll I'll show them a, a cherry tomato and they will ask me this is these are ten year old kids what is that and I just can't believe it hmm. and then we'll chop it up and we'll make a little salsa out of it and they're like oh I get it it's chips and salsa wow but they have no idea what 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 they're eating and once they grow it and they I mean, they can pull a carrot out of the ground with the dirt still on it and they would eat it right there wow it's so exciting for them so really the the the, the the biggest missing piece is just understanding that, that vegetables exist, they taste good, and not all vegetables are a match for each kid, but some kids love tomatoes, some kids love broccoli. They just need to know that it's out there, and uh, uh, they do not get that education. Um, unfortunately, I think even their parents don't have much of that education at this point. So we really need to get back into getting Americans growing food, getting kids growing food, uh, delicious food, fun food, You know, let's have them grow strawberries, let's mm. go cherry tomatoes, the kind of stuff that you just can't go wrong with and get them uh, more educated and more get them higher literacy so they can enjoy life. Yeah, absolutely. Where, where are you developing these projects? Like the inner city, food deserts? Yeah, inner cities everywhere. So we work across the country. Um, our The most in-depth work we've done is, is in Chicago, in Memphis, two of the hardest hit cities, uh, one of the most, uh, two of the most violent cities out there as well. We've, we've installed gardens, and this is gonna sound crazy, we've installed gardens with, with li live gunfire uh, fighting in the neighborhood and you know, we're we're from this little town in Boulder, Colorado. We're freaking out, and the kids just like they just move to their little corner where they know where their nose are supposed to be because they do they do these drills all the time, and they're safe from the gunfire. And then as soon as the gunfire stops, they just come right out back into the garden. Mm. <laughs> it's just so so some of these neighborhoods are very difficult, but that's where the work needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, statistics are, are dismal, like especially with regard to what children are eating today, about 70% ultra-processed foods. You know, it's the processed food that drives me nuts, you know, because I th uh, we, went, we went through this celebration of uh, technology around food in the sort of 70s and 80s and 90s where processed food became, as I said, like celebrated. And then you watch the obesity statistics, and from 95 to 2008, the the, in, the American body just went up by about 20 to 30 percent in size. Just ballooned. Just ballooned, and it's all all coincides with the the prevalence of processed foods across uh, across the system. So the the, the thing that so it's one thing if you if you need processed food to feed people, but actually if you go to McDonald's and you get a you know four a family of four whatever simple burgers and fries and you'll leave there for about 32 33 dollars. You go to a grocery store and you get a roast chicken with, or you get a, a fresh chicken and, and some broccoli and some carrots, you will leave there for under $10. Mm. And cooking that, you put all three ingredients at the same time in the same oven and the same pan, you cook it for one hour, you're good. Mm. There's, not, there's not much else to do. And it's a delicious meal for four people. But people are, are um, the world of cooking is, is really, uh, uh, it hasn't been celebrated, let's put it that way. And, and I think it's actually so great. It's a beautiful, beautiful experience to cook for your family, to cook for your friends. I grew up cooking, grew up uh, doing it truly as a love for, for myself. Like it was a gift for myself to cook for others. And uh, I, I believe that a huge part of the solution is uh, not just getting less processed food out there, but also, uh, hey, let's, let's bring the joy of cooking back into our lives. Mm. What do you say to people, though, that, that will argue that eating healthy is simply more expensive and that's why it's... So, uh, you know, it's, yeah, so inaccessible to so many. I, I think if you, if you have a, um, an approach for healthy, which requires higher, price, higher priced ingredients, like for example, you go to Whole Foods and you go, you go get an organic chicken and an organic broccoli and an organic carrots, yeah, you will actually spend more, but you won't spend that much more. You might spend $20 instead of $10, still cheaper than that McDonald's price. Uh, but if you, but if, if you really need to worry about the price, I, I wouldn't stress about organic. I wouldn't stress about it. I, I would just go and get 
fresh ingredients and, and cook it. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I feel like especially today on social media, there's this image of perfection that's sometimes pushed by, you know, wellness influencers and even medical professionals, um, you know, public public facing medical professional yeah. personas that, you know, if you're not eating everything, if everything's not organic, then you're doing something wrong. Yeah, I mean, what we, we, we have, we've had this debate at, at our restaurant. So the kitchen has been in Boulder for 20 years center of organic i mean uh, whole foods half of whole foods based there uh it really is uh it's a celebrated uh um product there and what we discovered was actually we cared about local much more than organic and it wasn't local because the food was there's there are benefits like carrots growing here a little different here and actually there was some cool cool factors there but it actually because we got to got to, got to know the farmer hmm. and um the more we got to know the farmer like oh we like how you do things oh Getting being organically certified, that's ten thousand dollars in legal fees every year. Yeah, you don't have to spend that. We're, we're happy to get your product. Mm. And honestly, we got those beautiful relationships. That's what mattered to us, and that's where it comes back. Even cooking for your community, which which I love when I think about my family and friends. But actually, if you expand your community to your local farmers, that's beautiful. So I, I would really think if if anyone's listening, to just think about like where did the food come from? If if you have an ability to connect, you know, through a farmers market or otherwise. That's a real win. When you do organic, I hate to say it, but the very, very large companies out there that have taken over the organic label, and <clears throat> they might they might officially be organic, but the who knows what the labor practices are like, or who knows where it's from, or or uh, I I would just say that it's a it's a it's a diluted label mm. for, at the very least. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. What about the role of community, which I know is something that you're yeah. super passionate about in individual health because there is this you know when talking about modern chronic non-communicable diseases they are largely 80 percent of non-communicable chronic diseases are lifestyle mediated and i know that there's you know a lot of experts will talk about the social contagion aspect of these conditions like obesity type 2 diabetes yep. what can you say to that well just to talk to that social contagion it, it is true the more you're around obese people the more obese you will be mm. and that of course becomes a snowball for for the entire community so i i will say that's a, that's that's a real problem and 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 i uh i hope i hope I've, I've been working on it for a long time i hope more connection to when you work with kids more connection to vegetables more connection to foods when i say vegetables i don't mean like oh they're going to be uh, healthier. I just mean it's, you have more variety in your life, and therefore you might choose to eat less processed food. But it's really you're you're really just trying to catch them young. But um, the uh, uh, I think the the what what people are trying to do today, they're trying to do a lot of biohacking. They're trying to do a lot of this. Well, this is what I can do to live longer. This is what I can do to to be a healthier person. And uh, what I I always come back to there's this beautiful study. It's a uh, Harvard study. They started it in, 90, in the 1930s, so it's almost 100 years old. And they started tracking people for longevity, and, they, and they're still tracking people today. They're in their 90s, and um, they they had a group of people from a wealthier part of uh, Boston, and a group of people from the lowest income community in Boston, and they tracked them all, and they've been following them now. For, um, and as I said, some of them are in the 90s, and the the. The, they went through well. What 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 were their diets like? They went through what were their their lives like, their careers, you know, any of these things. And the one, the only single thing that was a common uh, denominator that said that you would live longer and healthier and better was great relationships at the age of fifty. Wow. And I think that means a, that that's very powerful for me. Like community means being with your family or being with your friends and building those relationships because they'll, you'll keep those relationships all the rest of your life. What they learned was once you get past a certain age, you stop building deep relationships. And I, I would encourage anyone above the age of 50, keep building them, because why not? But actually, in this, in this study, they did, they, they would slow down, you know, and it, it became this attitude of, um, well, if uh, uh, in order for, for someone to get to know me, there's so much for, I, I need to know, and then they would, uh, you know, it feels like, because your other friends are 20, 30 years old, like 20, 30 years long of friendships. Um, but anyway, so once you, once you have, if you have those at age 50, which could be a great wife or partner or husband, um, or it could be um, from deep friendships uh, uh, with your family or friends, and you keep them, 
uh, it's the lack of loneliness hmm. that uh, it's the community sense of community that keeps you keeps you alive and well yeah it's so true at what point in your life did food become something that you wanted to focus on i know that you've gone through all this incredible extensive training as a chef yeah and then you launched the kitchen obviously in boulder but yeah walk me through your the the, the backstory yeah so i um i had never intended to be a chef never intended to do a restaurant I loved restaurants, though. I, I've always, always loved them. I, I cooked in one when I was a kid, and like was sixteen. And um, but I but I started cooking for my family when I was eleven. Um, my mom, my mom, was, <laughs> she won't be upset. She, she's self admittedly a, a bad cook. <laughs> <laughs> but your mom is a dietitian. She's a dietitian, exactly. So for Which, us, it yeah, was amazing. Um, very healthy eating growing up. Brown bread and and plain yogurt in the fridge as much as you like. Mm. Um, but. But she loved the fact that I was open to cooking. So she said, let's go to the gro- grocery store and you can uh, you can pick whatever you like. And um, so I, I, we went to the grocery store. In those days, there was a butcher that's separate. So I went next door to the butcher and I asked him, you know, I want to roast your chicken. And I'll still, these are still the best advice I've uh, still used to this day. Is I asked him, what, what do I do? And, you know, in, in those days, ovens were not as good as they are today. And sometimes many people's ovens are not... Not as good. So he just said, put it in in the in an oven as hot as it'll go for one hour. Salt and pepper, hot as it can go, one hour. And that that's still pretty much a tried and true recipe. So uh, today you might put it in at 450 degrees, pretty hot oven, and you'd roast it for one hour, and uh, you'll have a beautiful, crisp, you know, roast chicken, and, and there is nothing else to do. Wow. Now, if you do add salt and pepper, it'll taste a little better. If you do add a little, you know, chop of lemon and put stuff in the cavity, better. It, Throw some garlic in there, better. A little white wine in the pan, better. Okay, sure, there's a lot of cool things you can do. But at the end of the day, the, the basic recipe is just put it in the oven for one hour. Mm. And it's uh, um, and then you just get creative from there. So anyways, I started, I started that. My mom was very happy because it was also, for her, my mom's attitude to health is uh, nutrition is not eat less or, or any fancy diets. In fact, she's very much a- against the 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 diet crazes and she's seen them come and go. She's now 75, practiced dietitian, dietetics for 40 years. So she's a consulting dietitian, a lot to do with diabetes. So very, people are really struggling with their weight. In South Africa or here in the U.S.? South Africa, Canada, and the U.S. Wow. Yeah. And um, uh, and, and her, her approach is, you know, if there's color on your plate, you're probably eating well. Don't stress about it. If there isn't color on your plate, you're probably not eating well. Hmm. You know, that talks to too many carbs. Can be uh, can take take take, take down the, the the nutrition value of the food you're eating. So you really do want some, some colorful vegetables, um, but if you but it doesn't mean no carbs. It just means color on your plate. And I've loved that sort of very simple approach to 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 eating. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like refined carbs are typically all you know sh- white or shades of yeah, beige. Yeah, right. Totally. Totally. Um, and that's not to say that vegetables, yeah, don't contain carbs. Vegetables absolutely contain carbs. And I, you know, people should not be afraid of carbs in general, but also, you know, in the context of a whole food plant, um, you know, there's just, there tends to be so much good going for these foods, you know, yeah. aside from the, aside from the carbohydrates, which we've been, I think, indoctrinated into hyper fixating on in the era of diet culture. But, you know, you get fiber, you get these various phytochemicals, antioxidants, yeah. vitamins, minerals, so Absolutely. many good, good things. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I have, tr- I'm, <laughs> I would say I've tried. I have, I've dabbled in, you know, reducing, you know, or removing carbs. I've dabbled in, um, my, my wife is sort of, uh, she's, she, she cares so much for the planet. She cares so much for animals and so forth and so really tries to reduce um, animal protein in, in our diets. And, and I do reduce it, and it's okay. I don't mind. Um, but it, but, but it, um, I think that the, what, what I've learned for myself is if I have eggs in the morning, which I have almost every morning, and a beautiful scrambled eggs recipe in, in this book, that it's a soft scrambled egg that's almost meditative. So the, the experience is not just the food. It's actually you wake up in the morning, you're like, ah, I'm just mm. going to breathe a little in it. It's about t- a two-minute cooking experience, but two minutes of meditative time is actually quite quite a good amount of time. What's your favorite way to make eggs? So it, it's 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 in the book, but it's a it's a very very special recipe that you you uh, you you take the eggs, you you whip them in, uh, you, you scramble them, of course, with, in your with a fork while they're raw, and then you add salt, 
and some pepper, but the salt is critical because what it does, it breaks down the whites. Mm. And then you let it sit for about a minute, and um, and then you put your toast in the, in the oven, uh, sorry, to- toast in the toaster, and then I start cooking the eggs in a pan, and uh, you, you very slowly move them around, um, start out with a high heat, and then you drop it to low, right, and, and, it, and you get to the, the texture you like. I like them fairly soft. I love a del- delicious, creamy, soft, cr- soft egg. Same. And I, I have a stick, a little uh, a dab of butter that I put in at the beginning, and that, that butter actually just, uh, it almost like um, emulsifies with the egg rather than melts. So it's moving it slowly, and it starts to melt, like emulsify into the into the scrambled eggs, like a like a burr or a or a uh, yeah, if you know what a burr is. But um, but the um, uh, that that is a that is a dish that I have had. I'm not kidding, thousands of times. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also it's one of those dishes where every morning it's different because you how good am I at meditating that morning? Because you really have to focus to get it right. If you get it, if you're anyone listening, they, 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 you're going to try it a few times. It's, it's about learning, right? And as long as you embrace learning, I'm now thousands of times in and I am still learning. Hmm. You're like, oh, what would I have done differently that time? Yeah. And that's well, part of the meditation. Yeah. I, get, I mean, g- good cooking isn't about having some extensive ingredients list. It's, it's, yeah, it's, totally. it's about literally just being able to slow down. Slow down, exactly. I, I think that actually is another reason I got into cooking is this. I, I have a lot of in, internal anxiety that that has served me well in work, where I'm like, yeah, let's go, let's fight, you know, let's fight the dragons and, and you know, get 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 things done, and then I come home and I've got this built up energy, and then I start cooking and I just start calming down, and it's one of the greatest gifts. Hmm. You're trying to you you mentioned your wife is trying to reduce the amount of animal protein in your diet. You're a huge fan of eggs. What do you make of these um, fake meat products, fake egg alternatives? Yeah, um, like just I think it's the company's called just, just, just egg eggs. Just eggs, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I I don't like to trash anyone. I mean, I'm, I always want to keep keep uh, the uh, the potential open for it for it to be a good for it to, for it to be a good product. I just find that there's they're they're still in the category of highly processed food, and um, I'm. Again, I mean, I'm not, I'm going to reserve judgment for some time in the future where 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 it does make sense, but I haven't found it to be make to make sense so far for me. Yeah, that uh, that makes a lot of sense. So you grew up in this dietitian's household, yeah, which is so cool. Yeah, and then you, if I recall correctly from reading your book, you you began in tech, right, with your brother. I, any, I began exactly, totally. I had this. Uh, so I I came out of South Africa with this goal to actually be a Wall Street banker. Which clearly was not for me, but I didn't. I didn't know that I'd read all these. I read like Liar's Poker, the the, the book, a uh, famous book in the eighties about Wall Street, and it was actually about the collapse of Wall Street. But I was like, this is awesome. I want to get in there and you know join, jump in the Shark Tank and the whole thing. And I I I worked really hard for a summer job. I got a job on on like one of those kind of jobs, and I was there for one summer. I was like, I was wearing a suit, and I was like. Whoa! This is horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so I dropped all my courses, work, you know, changed my business uh, focus to more engineering and physics and things like that, more fun, more kind of fun stuff, philosophy, you know, more of a general degree, and started talking to my brother about uh, starting a company. We uh, did a road trip around the country in 1994, and we were brainstorming about this new thing called the internet. And what could we do with it? You know, we thought we, th- we thought there would be a good opportunity in, med- in medical, which there th- th- would have been if we focused there. And then we came across this idea, um, or sorry, this technology that was being developed by a company called Navtech. That was they were developing it for Hertz. So the, you guys remember the my, some of you re- listeners might remember the the Never Lost system. Yeah, that that actually was hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. You know, in early '90s, that that was not even usable till till the late '90s. Oh, wow. So so never lost didn't show up until you know the late '90s. But but actually, uh, in the mid '90s, we were able to get it from them. They they gave it to us. They said, if you can put this on the internet, just call us if you make any money. They were so nice. We were like 22, 23 year olds. I will say that is great about Silicon Valley. They they're so they embrace young people really well and. Uh, this is was another Silicon Valley company, and they literally had us write one a one pager. If you make money on this, you just got to call us, mm. and you we will figure out a deal. 
And so we put the for the first time maps and door-to-door directions on the internet, really like live door-to-door directions, which just was a magic trick. You just can't believe that this exists. Um, and it, of course, it took 60 seconds in those days, and you print it out on a printer, and you <laughs> take it with you in your in your car. But it's still amazing. I remember printing out like MapQuest directions. Yeah, so MapQuest came a little. Uh, they, they, MapQuest was the AOL product, mm. and so uh, if you were inside of AOL, you could you could use MapQuest. But if you're on the internet, then you'd use uh, you'd use you'd, you'd use us. But we were our product was mostly we were the technology behind the scenes for most for most of the players out there, and um, uh, but we didn't we didn't work with MapQuest. But but the um, yeah so so it was just a. Uh, um, yeah, so I got into tech. It was one of those things where I, I really, as I said, didn't didn't plan to get into cooking. I loved the idea of some you know, exciting business, and we built this company. It it was in, the, in Silicon Valley. It was it was the '90s, but you know, in those days, it wasn't wasn't that uh, what's the right word? It, it was it was frustrating because you couldn't make any money, and so so people figured out how to make money later, which which was a good lesson for me at the time because I just didn't know. I didn't know how to make money. I mean, we were just everything we did. We were trying to sell Yellow Pages ads. We were, we were doing all the traditional things, but actually, what was really going to happen was people would figure out how to make money with search, and then maps and door, door directions became free. Hmm. And um, uh, so we were we ended up getting acquired by Yahoo, and it was a great exit for us. It was the right thing to do, you know. But um, but the but for us, for me, it was a. I was like, wow, I was really frustrated that we couldn't build a business that we want that we could keep and grow. And so, so when when the company was acquired, I had some financial freedom, and uh, just kind of looked at it and said, you know, I, my, my fiance at the time was uh, uh, she wanted to move to New York. I was like, yeah, I'd like to come go to New York. And after a little prodding, she told me, you know, you always talked about cooking school. Now's your time. Yeah, yeah, the resources finally, mm-hmm. and the time, and certainly a time to take a break as well. It's been, it had been, you know, twenty four seven work and. Uh, uh, very difficult work, and mm-hmm. then you get out of it, and you're like, "What am I supposed to just go have a margarita at nine in the morning?" <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and so, so it actually was really healthy for me to get to get into cooking school. Yeah, it's like, I mean, chefery is no, notoriously difficult, yeah. and that, the, and the lifestyle alone is is supposed to be really challenging, is it not? Yeah. Yeah, you mean you mean the sh- sh- uh, sh- cooking, or you mean uh, like uh, being a chef, like working to become well, a chef? You know, like anybody it, who's like familiar with Anthony Bourdain's work, or in fact, in fact, I think um, uh, Anthony Bourdain, and I say this in my like briefly in my in my intro, I I was a huge fan of Kitchen Confidential, the the book that he wrote, and and it's kind of similar, I think, to my experience of reading about Wall Street when I was in the eighties. I even though his book was saying how hard it was and how difficult it was, I was really attracted to that. Somehow I just kind of liked that stuff. So I think that actually contributed a lot to me going to cooking school because I, I got excited for that energy. And um, and then when I went to cooking school, it was full on old school, screaming at you all the time. I, I, it was surreal. I kind of came from being this you know exciting tech entrepreneur in inside of that category, people knew who I was. Yeah. I've done cool things, was, and also you'd made a lot of money. I made a lot of money. I mean, I was I was a uh, uh, I was we were an internet darling. Like it was it was it was uh, we were one of the most successful outcomes in in the in that era. Like it was great. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't. I mean, we we were we we had worked hard. We had might have had our challenges with the business, but it was a great success. And then I go to cooking school, and I am. Just not not even worth the chewing gum on the bottom of his, of the of the shoe of these chefs. Yeah, what's that like? You're getting screamed at, or were you like an a, a sous chef or an assistant? Uh, no, so so what what way it works is at a um, at the time it was uh, now changed its name a little bit, but it used to be called the French Culinary Institute, mm. and it had some of the great chefs of our time: Jacques Pepin, Alain Saltner, uh, Andre, um, Alain Salhek, Andre Saltner, um, and and these guys are. Truly legends. I mean, they're fant- they're incredible, and, so, and they their approach to cooking was very old school. So they, the, you know, the Gordon Ramsay thing that that's pretty much what I what I experienced with you know, the Gordon Ramsay show. And so so they start out with you you pay ahead of time, and it's same price as going to Harvard. It's a very expensive fifty grand at the time or something to go to school, and you you start with twenty five students. You don't get your money back, and once you're in, 
uh, they uh, they start out the class with um, w- the first class is they, they roll in a skinned uh, lamb <laughs> with eyes in it still, and they roll it in and and just people start fainting. Whoa! <laughs> just like out of out of a TV show, and uh, and they're just like just to let you know what you're about to get <laughs> into, and you know maybe like three or four people don't even show up that the next class they're like. I cannot handle this. Wow! And then the next uh, next eighteen months was, I was just to tell tell my, my wife, I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna go to the school and just, I'm just gonna go get screamed at for the next six hours. I'll see you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, it really was. Um, it's a, it, it's an old school of old old type of teaching. I, I don't agree with it. Um, but you know, it's like this. Uh, you've seen the movie Full, Full Metal Jacket. Yeah. Yeah, it's great just movie. great movie. But that colonel that, or sergeant that just drills the, the 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 soldiers into nothing, screams at them all until they're really broken down into nothing. I think that's that's the goal. It was let's doesn't matter who you were, uh, because keep in mind this is a pretty well known school. So if you if you came in, you you a you had to have the money, which is pretty pricey. So a lot of these people were actually accomplished uh, chefs in New York. They wanted to go in and get the they hadn't gone to school, so they were, they were coming back in. This was their life savings, and so they were treating this very, very seriously. But if you're one of these famous chefs, you have to break down everything that they knew before, make them feel like they know nothing, and then build them up again. Hmm. And I and I did see that. So by the time I, we all left, we actually did have we we had their cooking theory in our in our DNA. Hmm. There's a lot of drug and alcohol use in that in that subculture, is there not? Probably uh, maybe as a result of how um, stressful it can be. I think it does attract some drug drug and alcohol culture. Uh, when you're in the restaurant world, that doesn't really last very long. Like the people who who we've been going for, at it for so long now, they'll come. They'll last for six months. They'll last for nine, and, they, and then you and then they, they just can't. You know. So so actually, the people who stick it out or do not have uh, do not have that. You just it's when you think about cooking, you are working. It's a twelve hour. I wouldn't call it a marathon, but it's a high energy jog at mm. the very least. Wow, um, twelve hours. So you start at eleven, you end at eleven p.m. So you, at eleven a.m. you start prepping for dinner, and then it goes into dinner service, and and you you'll go out at eleven that night, and you you really need your your wits about you. You need to be physically fit, and so uh, the the drugs and alcohol stuff just doesn't uh, just doesn't cut it. Mm. You got to really love what you're doing. You know, I've, it is it is a business p- people do because they love it. Yeah. They really, genuinely love it. The hospitality, energy, the um, the desire to to get feedback with every dish that you make. It's you know when you do software and internet stuff, you 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 create a product. You might, millions of people might see it, but you don't actually know these people. And it's no, it's very hard to get a connection. Like it's even you'll even do these focus groups where you're sitting in a room with a one way mirror and you're watching people use it, and you're like. Wow, that's crazy how they're using that. Uh, why they're moving the mouse over there? I'd never move the mouse over there, but it's that's how disconnected you are from the consumer. Whereas if you're in the restaurant, that food leaves your leaves the the expo station and it goes to the table. You you just you can walk right over and say how 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 was how literally how was your dish? Wow. And um, uh, that that you don't get into that business unless you you love that, that mm. part of it. Is there a moment uh, or memory for you at which point in your life you realized that you really loved cooking? Was it was there like a specific turning point? I would say that the I've always loved cooking, but I think that there was a t- major turning point for me when I when I um, uh, was in New York for nine eleven, and I, I it was actually after I'd learned to cook. I'd graduated from cooking school, and I had not intended to do a restaurant. I'd not intended to do really anything else with the degree other than just. Uh, be proud of myself for for going through it. Um, and um, I graduated literally a week or two before 9/11. 9/11 happens. I live downtown uh, at Chambers and Broadway, which is uh, very close to the World Trade Centers. Um, I get woken up to the sounds of the plane hitting the building. Wow, the first one. And the doorman says the, the the plane has hit the building. Plane, and I'm like, you know, you're a New Yorker, so. You're, some idiot is on a <laughs> stupid plane into some stupid building. Like you're just you're just so jaded, like it's fine. And then you, so I actually go take a shower and I get changed. Like no panic at all. Go down, <clears throat> go down the elevator. I get to the bottom of the elevator and the doorman is like, another plane is at the building. Another plane is at the building. And you still don't know what's going on because because all the building you're in. I was on Broadway, so there's the buildings are so tall you can't see anything further than you know a block away. 
And so I go across the street to go into this uh, deli, and unusually there are a lot of people in line at the deli. That 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 was a bit strange. I think maybe people were using it as their safe place because something was going on. So you could feel the vibe was weird, but still no one was panicking. And um, I was I, I knew them very well. I would live across the road, so I just took a couple of dollars out and put, helped myself to some coffee. And I was just about to leave, and over the radio it said the Pentagon got hit. Whoa! And that is when everyone just started running. It was it was like, oh crap! Well, this is not at all what we what we think. Uh, we were not like you can't be jaded, and we can't be like this is a New York or something, whatever. Like people literally just started running. We didn't even know what direction to run. You just started seeing the flow of people, and you just follow the flow because you still don't know what's going on up um, in the World Trade Center. It's, just, it's, it's, it's several buildings over, and, and you had a lot of tall buildings in between you. And um, so I go up, grab my wife. We just run out. And um, we left our idea and everything behind. We just didn't know what what we needed. We we literally had no idea what was going on, and so we ran. We the first building fell at Canal uh, just before Canal Street. We were at Canal Street, and we missed that sort of giant white cloud by about half a block. And it was that if you were inside that white cloud, uh, and I, we we for twenty years still had the an, annual health calls where they were, were, we were required to to, to respond to. How are your lungs? How are this? And, and we were fine. But if we had been in that cloud, uh, I'm 100% we'd have permanent health damage. And wow. we saw people coming out of that. They were just covered in white dust. You couldn't tell what skin color they were. Was there like asbestos in the white? Or uh, like? It's just that there's no way you could go through that yeah. without, without uh, having to breathe it in. Right. I mean, it's just no way. Like and, who knows what. And it's just it was a thick white cloud. I'm sure there's asbestos or whatever, but it's not good. Wow. Uh, so so I got up to Union Square. At this at this point, we still hadn't seen the one, the World Trade Center fall because you still can't see it. What was the like? What floor did you live on? In your, I lived on the tenth floor. Tenth floor. And so if we looked out of our window on the tenth floor, we could see the World Trade Center's burning. Hmm. Um, wow. But but uh, that's not the first instinct. We just needed to run. Yeah. So <clears throat> so we didn't really look at look out the window. We just like let's just run, and so. We were kind of people were saying something about the world, so you kind of you kind of have an idea what's going on. But it wasn't actually until Union Square I got up there where you can actually have a view <clears throat> of the World Trade Centers, and there was just one standing there, and we were like, "Whoa, there's just one." But that wasn't the worst thing. What the worst thing was the, when it, the second one fell, like right in front of my eyes, I saw the World Trade Center just crumble, <laughs> and I. I swear to God, I felt like reality was just breaking. Like it just was not possible. No, this can't be possible. This is just, it's like a mountain just collapsing in front of you. It's just, just not possible. <clears throat> and there it was, just collapsed in front of me. And it, it really was a, was a, uh, a joy. That was a, that was a life, <clears throat> life, excuse me. And that was a life, life changing moment to appreciate that how, how easy it is for, the direction of the world to change like just like pre 911 one 10 minutes later different that was that was really powerful and and difficult experience but out of the beautiful the beautiful part of it was i went up to my mom's place she's on she was on 22nd and park she was housing like 8 to 10 other people we were all sleeping on the floor there for about a week and uh, uh actually there for two weeks but for that after about one week the, she gets a call to ask if she wants to be a volunteer for the to cook for the firefighters. So, what the way it was working in New York, there were so many people trying to volunteer because millions of people just desperate to help. And so it was really about what, what your skills were. And she was a very well known dietitian, and she said, "Look, I can't cook, but my son can cook, and he just got his diploma from the cooking from the French Culinary Institute." And you know, they said thank you very much, but actually, we have a long list of others that that. Um, uh, <clears throat> that are before him. And she said, okay, but just so you know, he also has a security pass because he lives down there. And they're like, oh, wow, he has a security pass. That's a different deal. So they actually invited me down to cook. And we cooked out of this restaurant called Boulet that, that the whole front of the restaurant had been blown blown apart. Wow. But the back of house, which was a beautiful, one of the best restaurants and be best kitchens in the in the world probably. And then underneath the entire basement was fine. And that was there was a lot of cooking could be done there. We cooked for six weeks, 16 hours a day, um, all day long, 
for the firefighters. And I started out peeling potatoes, so happy to be there. Moved up one thing, one thing, eventually got to the saute station, which is like the fancy one. And that's where I got to work with some of the best chefs in the world because they would come in for one day at a time or two days at a time. And I would just get to learn from one amazing character after the next. And then um, uh, I eventually got to the highest level, which was you actually drive the ATV down to uh, down to Grand Zero. Wow, they were using ATVs? Yeah, you, like we take a cooler, like you know, tr- traditional like orange cooler that you'd use for beers at a... At a, a, a you know tailgate a, a tailgating yeah. at a concert, um, the um, uh, you put a, you, we cook this beautiful food. I remember cooking salmon with dill sauce, and you just you take layer you layer a little you know um, a parchment paper down between each layer. But the salmon was cooked beautifully, and it, it was so such a beautiful dish. And we put it in the cooler. I put put it on the back of the ATV, drive it down to with you know with the radios and everything. Drive it down to. Uh, ground zero, unload the cooler, put it into this gymnasium that, that was converted to a cafeteria, and we would feed the firefighters, dish them these beautiful dishes, one dish at a time, beautiful food, the food that, that we hope they felt, I felt like I felt like they were really like, grateful. And mm. it, it, you could see it in their eyes, you know, they, they, they would come in, they have these shells on, and it was covered in this horrible white dust, and the smell was pervasive it was so rough it was, it was just I went, uh, too hard to describe and it lasted that lasted for months it wasn't just the, the weeks we were there but then they would take these shells off and they, they would have this gray look in their faces and they would sit down and we would bring them their food and they wouldn't say anything for the first five ten minutes and then eventually they'll start talking with each other eventually the food would kind of get in their system and they start relaxing, and you could just see the color come back into their face. Wow! And you just like, oh wow, this is this is beautiful. This, we 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 took what was absolutely the most traumatic experience of all of our lives, and turned it into this beautiful feeling of community and connection. Mm-hmm. And these these firefighters would, by the forty five minutes was the end of their break, they would be full of life. They would put on those shells, go right back out into these giant piles of melting metal giant piles like 12 feet 12 stories high and they would just go dig through it to help find american lives and save them it was just incredible yeah man god bless those firefighters so it was actually then that i was like you know i really this is the thing i want to i want to do a restaurant i want to i want to commit um, my life to it yeah wow what a story that's incredible it's so funny what you said about new yorkers in new york it's like i'm a new yorker i grew up in new york city and i was in manhattan uh on 9-11 in, you were? Yeah. I wow, where were you? Yeah, I uh, grew up in Murray Hill. Yeah. And um, I was like 22, 23 years old. And, uh, or maybe younger than that, like 21. 20. I was probably 20. And uh, I was in my, my my family's home, which was like a 35-story building in uh, in Murray Hill. And we had a, an amazing view of the World Trade Center, mm. even from Murray Hill, which is like in the 30s um, of Manhattan. And, but just, it just like when you said that it, it so rang a bell because it's like in New York, it's always something. So you, you do get yeah, jaded. It's always something. Exactly. It's you get always so something. jaded. I know. Yeah. You get so jaded. So <laughs> I remember I was actually in bed when it happened because it happened on like the most pristine, beautiful blue morning, but yeah. it was like eight, nine in the morning. And I was like, uh, I was sleeping in that day because I was taking classes at the time, but I, you know, I had, I guess my class w- classes were starting somewhat later. And I remember my alarm clock at the time was the Howard Stern show. Okay. So, yeah, so I would always wake up to the Howard Stern show, who I was a fan of at the time, and they were talking about, like, the, the fact that the one of the World Trade Centers had been hit. And I remember, like, hearing, like, a little bit of the, uh, you know, about it, and then I hit snooze, and I went back to sleep. And I woke up, <laughs> right. and I slowly, yeah, as I'm rubbing my eyes, I stumble over to my living room where there's, like, these huge windows, and I see the smoke billowing yeah. from the towers. And, uh, and I called my mom. My mom at the time was like, she was running around the garment center where she was working. And yeah, it was like utter panic. Yeah, certain, it, it, it took know. a long time. It took like 30 minutes to get to panic. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. The first, first 10, 15 minutes were like, what? <laughs> what? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Because, you know, the, the World Trade Center had been bombed before. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, Right? Yeah. Like in, in New York, it literally is like you just become so calloused. Yeah. Well, for us, the, the, the general feeling was, at least for me, it was a small plane. It hit some random building. It didn't it didn't connect to me that it was the World Trade Center. It just yeah. was 
a small plane, some some idiot had done that, and and of course that still isn't a good thing, but it's right. not it's not the nine eleven no the, the like, scale of nine eleven the scale of it was just yeah impossible to comprehend. It, in fact, that's what I mean by reality breaking. It was impossible to comprehend. This yeah. is not a thing. There's no way. Hmm. Crazy. Wow, what a story! But the 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 silver lining is beautiful. That yeah, it, it, it was a it, I, what I found with everyone involved in that that activity, whether you were whether you were chefs or I mean certainly firefighters are in a whole different category. Those guys were really risking their lives, but there was a whole group of volunteers that that were just there to um it gives you something to do when you're processing trauma, and uh, uh, I think for the people who were not able to volunteer, just sitting around because you couldn't work either. Everything was shut down. I think that would that would have driven me crazy. Mm. So I'm really glad I had that. Yeah, amazing. So then, at what point did you launch the kitchen in Colorado? Yeah, so we went to uh, my my wife and I were we uh, we um, went to uh, we thought about where we wanted to live, and we started a road trip that started in Chicago. We had a, a camper van and we just camped around the, the, the U.S. Well, I wanted to do it in February when the weather was the worst in most places. I wanted to, like, where, what is it really like? You know, let's go February. Let's do it in February, which is not a great time to do a camping trip. Um, but still, we had a great time. And we went through uh, Jackson, you know, Chicago all the way to Jackson Hole, Denver, Boulder, um, uh, Santa Fe, down to San Diego, all the way up to Seattle. And you know the one that won out was Boulder. You know, just a beautiful the the winter there's very dry winter, so it's crisp. It's it's not that sort of humid cold, even though Seattle was uh, was warmer by the temperature gauge. It was much colder in the way you felt in your Interesting. body. Interesting. And so I I also grew up in South Africa at a mountain level, so not quite as high, but they say four thousand feet. This is five thousand feet, and so th- it just there's something about it that reminded me of what felt like home. Hmm. And I've been there for twenty years, so it definitely definitely became that yeah and so it was my instincts were right but uh the other thing that i loved about it was it was a restaurant town it's a small town but actually for its restaurants per capita it's got the same restaurants per capita as new york city big foodie culture there right huge foodie yeah. culture, huge 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 and we were talking a little bit about earlier about boulder being a center for organic center for for natural foods it also had that going for it, it wasn't just the restaurant scene but it had these startups that were coming out of it it was uh, it was it continued to be the one of the great centers for 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 that, mm. uh, and so so I I felt it was like the right home for it, um, and then uh, we were walking just down the street and on our way to this little black lab, beautiful black lab, but young, broke off the leash and went up to this guy Hugo Matheson at uh, this bakery, and he's an English guy. He just got his green card, became was the head chef at a local restaurant, and I said I'm gonna start a restaurant, uh, and he said you come on over for dinner. And I'm from New York. Like, New Yorkers do not invite people over for dinner. And I'm like, you see a serial killer? Like, no, this is probably how Boulder works. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone just is, it's like the Truman Show. Yeah. Um, but actually, that wasn't really a Boulder thing. It's just, he, he, he never invited anyone over for dinner that quickly either. It just mm. was, it just felt right. And um, it, Boulder, of course, is quite nice. It's not, I'm not saying that it never happens, but, but that was a special occasion. And so we ended up going over for dinner, and his, his training was Italian um, farm to table. So there's a restaurant in London called the River Cafe, which uh, had been working with local farmers, uh, or not necessarily local, but they might find them in Italy that they know well. And that sort of concept of connecting to your farmer, knowing who they are, and then they, they, they bring you the best produce, or they get it to you in some way that is uh, the best. And so he he didn't have this French, what I had for his French, which was, we're going to put 50 ingredients in it. It's going to take six hours, and it's going to be good, but it's more, oftentimes more about using the worst ingredients and turning it into something great, hmm. whereas the Italian food is more about using less ingredients, very, very high quality, and then you make something great. And it was amazing to me to watch him cook for us. All he did was charge uh, sea bass with salsa verde, which uh, recipes in in the book, and a um, uh, little bit of a braised eggplant, and I was like, this is one of the best meals I've ever had. And I've just come from New York cooking with the best people that I thought were the best people in the world. And it just opened my eyes to another style of cooking. And so uh, I actually asked to stage with him, which means to go work for someone in, a, in another restaurant where you're training. Um, I was paid $10 an hour for a year learning his style of, of food. Wow. And we got to know each other really well. And I said, you want to go do the restaurant together? 
And uh, my wife at the time, which is Jen and Hugo and I started the kitchen 2004. Amazing. Yeah. I've been there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. 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 Oh. I'm, a, I'm a patron. I, I was in, I've only been to Boulder once. And, uh, and I remember hearing about your restaurant. Somebody, somebody you know, recommended it to me uh, based on what they knew about how I like to eat. Yeah. You know, high quality ingredients, yeah. simple cooking. And, uh, and I, I remember eating there and, and loving it. And so uh, it's cool how things all kind of come full circle. I love that, you, I love that you've been there. And I, and I, I, I do know the, 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 the diet you ascribe to, you know, which, which I, I think is, is it's one that I follow. You know, and our restaurants follow where, where we really try to, to have a balanced f- a food where you, you, you might have we, – we're not, no, we're not a zero carbs. We're a, we're a, we're, we have a, the best French fry recipe on the planet. Mm. Um, but but it's, uh, really it's about sort of the protein with your vegetables. And I, and I want to say that we, we're very proud of all of our dishes. I will say our most popular dish, which is amazing, is our um, cauliflower dish, which is a main dish for sharing, and it is completely vegan and gluten-free. So mm. even though we do have a variety of... Uh, uh, What's the dish? Um, it's, cris- it's called our crispy cauliflower dish. It is... Oh. It is um, it's fantastic. I love it, cauliflower. Yeah, it is. Honestly, it really is. It deserves to be number one. Hmm. Um, that being said, our, our most of our menu is, is is we celebrate the ingredients. We celebrate the sourcing of the ingredients. We celebrate some unique flavors we're able to pull together. But we really don't think about uh, we don't think about gluten. We don't think about ve- uh, vegetarian. We think about what's the right what's the right what's, what's what should this dish taste like? What what are the right ingredients? What's the right balance for the plate? And and I think people really really appreciate that. Yeah, you've got a ton of great veggie options on the on the menu that I've seen, and also in your in your book, the kitchen. We are so proud of our vegetables. In fact, I think the carrots on our, our menu are the best. It's the best dish on the entire menu. Really? Yeah. Wow, I got to try those. But I I also really appreciate that you guys aren't shy with regard to the animal protein. We are. I've noticed that you have, you have a lot yeah. of lamb dishes. Oh, the, yeah. So one of the one of the things we so we have we have a, a community that. Uh, you, you, I think your audience will resonate with. We live in Boulder. It's a um, um, very much a, a, my diet is better than your diet kind of uh, culture. Oh yeah. You know whether it's zero carbs or or sorry, no eggs or or vegan or or no seeds and oils. I'm not. We we respect them all. <laughs> We're not here to tell you. Welcome what. to social media, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. <laughs> but wow, the, you know the vo- the voices are loud, you know, and so so and we will we'll let people come in and give us the strangest diet you've ever heard of, and we will accommodate them because we are we've learned that that is our community, and we and we love that. Um, but but the other thing that we we love is we love really knowing where our food comes from. So we um, we did this one time where where we raised animals on a, on our. One of our favorite uh, local farms called Cure Farm, and we raised our animals, and they they were like pets for us. They were like animals that we wouldn't call them pets, but more like we we looked after them. So we named our pigs rhubarb and custard, and we named our lambs Nessie and Bessie. And where we really got got in trouble, but it actually worked out well in the end. We we thought it would be good to give our guests a real connection to the food. So instead of saying you know lamb with couscous on the menu, we said. Uh, Nessie and Bessie with couscous, and people are like, well, "What's Nessie and Bessie with couscous?" Well, <laughs> those were the lambs that we raised, and we got an uproar <laughs> from the ve- vegetarian and vegan community, and actually it worked out well because we 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 were very we were very much engaged in the conversation with them, and we said we believe that our guests should have a good connection to what they're eating, and if if uh, they if they really do have a connection, they can choose not to eat it. Mm. But we don't. We didn't want them to eat the food without having that connection. And actually, that I really that I really helped because in the conversation with the vegans and vegetarians, they 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 oftentimes will say people don't understand that they're eating, <clears throat> and you know, they they just think food comes in a in you know plastic wrap in Whole Foods or something. They don't yeah. think that it actually comes from an animal. And so when we when we really explain that this is about creating people, giving the people a connection to their food. And if they are gonna um, eat eat an animal, know that it was a, it was a living animal, and so it actually turned around in our favor, where uh, we got um, we got, oh, which was gonna sound strange, but we, they went from from haters to like really being celebrators of the kitchen, um, and and in the Boulder, as you as you 
discovered when you went to Boulder, we're, we're, we're an institution. Mm. And so we really figured out a way to become friends with each, each uh, camp, uh, also by accommodating people, but also by being honest. You know, this is what we believe. And this is, we're, we're gonna push it to a little bit, some, somewhat of an extreme sometimes by putting the names of the animal on the, on the menu. Not always, and then we'll pull it back and and serve the serve it in a way that is more 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 normal for for a guest. But 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 having fun with it, being a little bit more relaxed about it, I think has served us well. Yeah. Well, any press is good press. Any engagement is good engagement. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. But I, I completely agree that as an omnivore, it is very important to know where it is that your food is coming from, and to and to develop and cultivate an appreciative relationship with. The animals who essentially were sacrificed for yeah. your nour- nourishment. Yeah, you know, I'm a big advocate of omnivory, but I think we need to be conscious and ethical about it. I, I think so. I think it's really just to be aware that uh, if I'm, I want to be careful because there are many people that that really have to be price sensitive. They don't have a choice. Right. Right. And so I still believe in uh, even if you if you can't afford it, there there are going to be many people that are really like, you know what, I I I can still celebrate, of course, that this is a um, an animal, and I can still thank thank it for for its for its life that it's giving. That that's that's one form of consciousness. I think the other one where it gets about price is when you're like, well, I need to know exactly who the farmer is. I need to know exactly where it comes from. And I think people like us at the kitchen, we can do it because we have professionals running the show. Yeah. But for for the average consumer, you have to trust Whole Foods or others, and that means you're paying a lot more for it. And I think yeah, if you can afford it. Pay, pay that price that farmer needs it because it is more expensive for them to to run their operation but if you can't afford it just d- don't worry about it just yeah. just go with the cleanest simplest less least processed ingredients you can find yeah i personally don't feel that i need to get that granular with where with where my food comes right, from right exactly yeah you know I, I i don't feel that i need to get that granular as long as i'm acknowledging that there was a degree of uh, suffering, however small, yes, however, right. I think that's right. That's where the consciousness ephemeral. comes in, and that'll happen in, yeah. in any any situation. And and um, uh, I'm, you know, it's a circle of life. I, I'm just not. I don't have the. I don't. I don't. I, I've never never had it. I, I, I still don't have it. The the the. Um, uh, what's the right word? Um, I I I do appreciate an animal giving of its life, but I don't. I don't have the. So, uh, there's so, so something that a lot of people have is the sort of we should not be doing that. I just don't have that. Yeah, it just feels very natural for me. Well, I also feel that the way to change a system is not to opt out of it entirely, but to vote with your dollars. Yeah, totally f- for the system that Absolutely. you want to see flourish. Yes, for the better dollars. alternative. Exactly. exactly. No, that's right, and I think that um, you know I've got friends of mine who constantly do vegan restaurants because again, this is our community. We we do try. The, the the community does try, try and and they they struggle mm-hmm. you know it's a um, it's 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 one thing for 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 vegans to if they vote for their dollar they, they can vote for it by ordering the vegan dish at our at our restaurant which by the way is the most as I said it's the most popular dish because we have a lot of vegans and vegetarians in in Boulder but if you try and do an entirely vegan restaurant you you're, you're forcing people who are meat eaters to vote with their dollar and then they, they actually will and then it's the, it's very hard to keep a restaurant busy mm. and so I've seen one after the other and I you know I, I do my best to guide them to say you know come on give you're gonna have to give a little here a good little there and anytime you're you're very um, I was the right word uh, ideological about about it most customers are not ideological they just want good food they want to have a nice time with their friends yeah. Couldn't agree more. If you could change one thing about the food system in this country, what would it be? If I could change one thing, I would change the federal dietary guidelines. So the way the way why why that is so important is the federal di- dietary guide. My wife is actually she's a food policy uh, expert. So um, Christiana Musk, so she's great. She's got a good. She did a chapter in Fooding Two. If anyone's if anyone's a fan, mm, wow. um, also talks a lot about the vegan world and the and the productionist world. So anyway, for the for the truly Wonky, wonky academics out there. This is a good one. I hope she's able to keep, keep those two uh, interests separate. You know, the interest in public health policy and her interest in, in veganism. Yeah, well, she's she's she was a vegan. Now she's something else. But I, mm. I don't want to speak for her because she's really is, is trying to figure out wh- her path. But the but her what she's able to do is in and she does summarize it in in this book, Fooding Too. 
to, to actually respect different viewpoints. Love that. N- not to say that she agrees with them. Yeah. But they are there. Yeah. Like there are people who are meat lovers. Like mm. they are there. Like, come on, guys, leave, leave it alone. Don't pretend they're not there. They are there. Yeah, okay, we're now, here. Now, how do you how do you interact with them? Or there are vegans. Yeah. Meat lovers, get over it. There are vegans, you know, like get over it. And yeah. and so it's like this more of a higher higher level view on things. Um, but the um, uh, the one thing I would change is is the federal federal dietary guidelines. They, they, while they seem like good guidelines to us, they are actually the requirements for federal procurement. So if you see, they'll put they'll be the milk will be in there. Well, that's the milk lobby um, forcing it to be there fighting tooth and nail to be have it been there. Well, there's bread in there, and it's bread lobby fighting tooth and nail to be in there. Now, all that stuff doesn't sound that bad, except that what milk and, milk lobby does is, well, we'll put chocolate milk in there so people actually drink it. Mm. And then it's then you're really just giving them chocolate milk. Or the bread lobby will do these Wonder Bread because that's what kids will eat. And so if the federal guidelines could change, which is, uh, my wife has actually worked on them, it's very, very hard to change because of the, the system. But if I could wave a magic wand, that's what I would change. Yeah. The 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans Committee, 95% of the people on the committee had conflicts of interest with of pharma, with the, with the food industry. Yeah. No, it's, it's entirely driven by the, the lobbying world. Yeah. It's an economic... The dietary guidelines are an economic instrument. They're not, they're not in my view, evidence-based. Or they may be evidence-based, but the evidence that on which they are based is very weak evidence. Exactly. And evidence that is that has essentially been you know, highly influenced by the food industry. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and literally by lobbyists, because if you take milk out of the federal dietary guidelines, you will bankrupt thousands of farmers mm. overnight. And while you might see that as lobbying, if you're senators or you're a governor or whatever, and you're in those states, you lose your job. Yeah. Like these are voters who are very influential voters. They might not be a lot of people, but they'll vote in the primaries, they'll vote in the caucuses. They will fight for that. Well, dairy, to me dairy's not the issue. It's that the it's it's that the dietary guidelines tr- historically have not placed enough effort on reducing consumption of ultra processed foods, which tend True. to be grain based. Yeah. It, it, there's they, no there's no rule against process. You can do milk and make it processed like put add chocolate milk yeah. in there and it's just basically sugar yeah or you could take bread and make it ultra processed yeah there's no rule against that and i also think that they un- unfairly uh relegate red meat and other animal source uh proteins to you know to like just a tiny proportion of the plate and i think that that is largely influenced by money because of the fact that it's the grains that are subsidized and the grains constitute the bulk of these ultra processed foods, which are incredibly high margin and are really the the bread and butter in terms of where these companies. Yeah, the the, the, the grain subsidy, corn subsidy in the in this country is, I mean, it's just a scam. I mean, like it's just they 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 figured out how to grow so much corn in this country that in the mid two thousands, uh, uh, President George W. Bush, he he was facing a, a political crisis because the farmers were going to be in an uproar that they didn't know what to do with the corn. Wow. And so they created the ethanol subsidy, which was a disaster for, for our farmland, for sure, but a massive subsidy for them because they needed something to do with the corn. Hmm. And so it takes a gallon of petroleum-based oil to make a gallon of ethanol. Wow. It's the worst idea in the world. Yeah. And you, but you get to use the corn so the farmers would have something to do with their new corn. So what's happened from the 70s to, to now, well, not quite now, but till maybe the mid-2000s, it's flattened off a bit, but, but now, is the, the um, productivity of our farms have gone through the roof. Hmm. So back in the 70s, there was a food crisis and, uh, you know, got to feed the world, things like that. But then we sort of do things like Roundup Ready, all these kind of really bad things to our food that... You know, we fix a few. We fix some of that stuff, but not all of it. And um, but the result is productivity went through the roof to a point where now we don't know what to do with the food. Mm. And that's where the lobbyists come in and they put it into federal guidelines and they jam these uh, grain-based uh, products into our uh, f- federal uh, guidelines, uh, where it's totally cool to just put corn syrup into uh, everything, 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 and that's just uh, part of the subsidies. Yeah. 
And there's nothing wrong with corn. No, in, no, of in course. And of itself. In, in corn, corn is delicious. Who yes. doesn't love corn on the cob? <laughs> yeah, right, you exactly. Know, like come summer. Yes. It's one of the best things to throw on the grill, yeah, in my view. Absolutely. But um, You get a little char on it. Yeah. And then you put some butter on before you eat it with some salt. So good. <laughs> do you have a, I know it's like kind of picking a favorite child, but do you have a favorite recipe in the book? Well, actually, funny enough, there's, there is a corn dish in this. It's a, it's a really fun riff on, on corn. Um, it is, uh, you, take, you take corn, there's some this delicious vinaigrette in there and some little, a couple of other vegetables, and then you, you mix it. So it's fresh. Like you, you grilled it, you cut it, off the, cut it off the husk, and then you create a bowl with, with a little vinaigrette, and you mix, mix in cornflakes. Whoa. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and it gives you this crunch of the cornflakes with corn. And you can use organic cornflakes. You don't have to use the more processed one, but um, all, all of them are great. And uh, we actually make our own. We make our own little oh, complex. But um, but the uh, uh, that sort of combination of the two is such a such an obvious, but also no one ever does this mm. uh, mix of flavors. I wonder if there's yeah. I mean, I haven't actually looked at this, but there's probably some organic, ingre- you know, single ingredient corn flake oh, yeah, sure. varieties yeah, yeah, on the market. Plenty. There's plenty. There's plenty. That would probably be a great pre workout energy source yeah, you know yeah, yeah. not promoting yeah. cornflakes oh, corn, yeah, exactly exactly <laughs> <laughs> very interesting well people should definitely check out the kitchen it's a beautiful book i i read your introduction i skimmed through it the recipes look fantastic you've Thank got you. a, a lot of great also cool informational little like uh sidebars in the book on so, how to buy you know the best salt yeah which i think is great yeah no i, I think what i wanted to do with this cookbook was if you've never cooked before the, this is a great intro it's got some great essential tools in your kitchen and then there are also people who cook for. I, I'm I'm always surprised. There are cook, people I've, I've cooked with for 20 years, and we will share kitchen hacks that we that I don't know, or he doesn't know, or she doesn't know, and we're like, oh, I need to write these down. Hmm. So I started writing them down, and so there are a whole bunch of hacks in there that are. Uh, okay, how do you separate an egg yolk from egg white? Well, here are two easy ways, and uh, and if and every other recipe out there just says separate them, hmm. but actually most people. There's many ways to do it. Here are two easy ways. Yeah. You know, things like that. Whenever I post about my love of poached eggs on social media, I'm surprised by the number of people who don't know how to simply poach an yeah, egg. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's one of my favorite ways to eat yes. eggs. It's great. No added oil needed. Yeah. It's super tasty. Yeah, I love it, man. Yeah, it's 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 very much about I mean, for me, the, our recipes are in this book are fantastic. They're delicious. They're a little bit more cuz you kind of want to impress your friends or family. And then and then mixed in there are dishes that I cook myself all the time, like the scrambled eggs dish or the roast chicken dish that that they're just so easy mm. and delicious, absolutely delicious. Love it. Well, thanks for writing it. Thank you. Yeah, I got one last question for you before we get to that. Uh, where can people pick it up and where can they find you on social media? So they can order from uh, any of their local bookstores. They can order from Amazon. Uh, you can find me on social media at Kimball on X or at Kimball Musk on Instagram. And um, uh, book uh, launches March 12th. So if you order it now, uh, it'll arrive on your doorstep on March 12th. Amazing. Well, great to get to know you. Thank you. And last question that gets asked everybody on the show, what does living a genius life mean to you? I think it means uh, living life with curiosity and living life with uh, a learning mindset. You're constantly uh, willing to... Take take a situation, no matter how difficult it is, and not panic. Um, it's like one of my brother's favorite phrases: "Don't panic." <laughs> but really, truly, don't panic, and uh, say, "Okay, what can I learn here?" And just constantly learn, constantly learn, and you'll be amazed what what you can achieve at when you have that attitude. Mm, love that. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here, and I'll see you there.